Henry Ford's introduction of the Model T in 1908 gave birth to the auto industry as we know it, democratizing the horseless carriage and changing the world. More than a century later, Jim Farley, CEO of Ford Motor Company, is catalyzing cultural change at America's largest automaker. Under Farley, whose grandfather worked for Henry Ford, the company is splitting into two divisions, one focused on traditional internal combustion engines and one dedicated to electric vehicles. As an equity analyst covering autos and shared mobility, I was eager to learn more about Jim's vision for Ford and the future of the auto industry. So I traveled to Ford's headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan, where I sat down with Jim and found a little time to test drive the F-150 Lightning, an electric reinvention of an American icon that will help determine Ford's leadership in the century ahead. Jim, thanks for being with us today to talk about the future of this industry at such an important time. It's so cool to be here with our products too, you know. As a CEO, you can get isolated, and uh, for me, it's always about the product. Yeah, it all starts with the product. So people that know you well and work with you, describe your infectious passion and intensity. Where does, where does that come from? I think it comes from my love of cars. <laughs> I just have always been Jimmy Car Car. My whole life is cars. Mm -hmm. I rebuild cars, all my friends are car people. So my passion is really serving customers through this thing called transportation. Now you race vintage cars. Yes. And um, my understanding is in order for you to take the CEO role, you had to be allowed to keep racing. Yes. So how does racing a 78 Lola or a <laughs> GT40 help make you a better CEO? Well, first of all, it's very humbling. You have breakdowns, you have problems. But the biggest gift for me is I'm around car people, but they don't really care I'm the CEO. It allows me to compete without being a jerk about it. Um, but most of all, it just really relaxes me because for that hour race or eight hour race, I'm not thinking about anything other than doing a good job in the car. And when I get done, I have this great sense of like a vacation, almost mentally. You say it's your yoga. It is my yoga, for <laughs> okay. sure. Well, I had a, a yogic experience yeah, I uh, had driving that thing earlier today <laughs> uh, on the track here in Dearborn. Good. It, it was so smooth. Yes. You're pretty proud of this thing. Behind I you. am. You yeah. know why? Because we had like three people. Uh, almost against the odds in the company. Mm -hmm. Why are you gonna electrify F-150? Everyone's happy with their F-150, why? And a few people that were opinionated uh, really helped us see the light. I'm proud of it because of that. Because in this world of business plans and uh, focus groups, we didn't use any of it. You've been outspoken about some existential challenges facing Ford Motor Company and the industry. So was there a specific moment or event that made you realize we need some real changes here to set ourselves up to be viable for the future? I think the second quarter earnings last year from, from Tesla to completely reorient the company with Model 3 and Model Y on a radically simplified standardized product and then to execute well for them to make $10,000 aside from you know, selling credits and stuff that was a complete aha moment. Our world just changed. It's never gonna change back. You've drawn strength from your leadership style and your experience by being an outsider. Mm -hmm. but now you're coming up on 15 years at the yes. company. How do you maintain that outsider advantage to keep catalyzing cultural change at Ford for a company that, let's say historically at least, maybe drew strength from being insular? I get my strength from outside perspective. I spend probably 20 or 30% of my, the average day talking to people not in the car business. And I ask them very specific questions. What is a superior embedded system? What would the competitive advantage be if we have the best uh, embedded system where we can sh ship more software to the car? Like, what does that mean? Jim, you recently announced plans to essentially divide the company into two divisions. Yes. Uh, one focused on combustion technology and the other focused on electric vehicles. What's the business case for doing this? 
Well, I, I saw my team struggling with trying to do everything all at the same time. But Tesla ran through our industry like a Shinkansen train through the Tokyo station without a stop, right? I don't want to be on a hand cart pumping my way up to them. When I started to really listen to Doug Fields and the new people that have joined Ford, and, and I, I really understood what it takes. And then I started calling peers and in other industries that have gone through this. I realized very quickly that the only way for us to really speed up the digital innovation is to get more focus. The core business, our old internal combustion engine, has to focus on restructuring and being profitable as it shrinks. Our new business have to have freedom to innovate without any speed issues. You could take a transmission engineer and teach them about batteries, but I don't have five years. <laughs> I have months. But what we didn't do is spin them out because mm -hmm. there is a lot of interdependence and we're not gonna be successful as a company if we have this focus, but still we don't leverage each other's strength. Some stakeholders may be potentially concerned about how the reorganization of the business could affect Ford culturally. What's your message to your 200,000 employees globally? I would say this, our values are our values, but to move fast and really catch up with that Shinkansen train, we, we, we can still keep our values, but we have to just speed up completely. And what I would tell people is the same, we're not gonna redo the company's values. Mm -hmm but you are gonna change the culture, the working culture. So, you know, in sports, uh, a driver can be a really good endurance driver. They could be really good at a qualifying lap. You're never gonna get a great qualifier to be a good endurance driver. What I believe in business is you should put your team in a place where they can execute things that come naturally for them. Mm -hmm. So you can't win in this industry without attracting and retaining the best talent. Yes. And when it comes to EVs and AVs, a, a lot of that talent's gonna come from outside the traditional auto industry. Jim, how the heck did you get Doug Field to leave <laughs> Apple, where he was running the Apple car project, and come over to Ford? Well, I, I spent eight months with Doug. First of all, it took me several months when I got out of Dearborn to kind of find out What's the kind of talent we need to get serious about insourcing EV components and an embedded electric architecture? And then I wrote down all the names. There's one name that kept coming up, no matter who I talked to, Doug Fields. I'm <laughs> like, who is this guy? So then I got on a plane and I just got to know him and I listened to him. He felt really strongly that he wanted to get his hands dirty and, and coming to Ford, he could have freedom. All right. Earlier this year, remember when Doug was asked about talent and yes, what yes. kind of people we want to get yes, here? Yes. So this is this is for Doug here. here. <laughs> oh, that is great. Yeah, he was talking about can, bunny slippers. Can, we can, this, those are like the original, <laughs> the Christmas story ones. Oh, oh that's fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait. Well, see him tonight. There you go. He'll love that. Go. Thank yeah. you so yeah, much. That's for Doug. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, a lot of people draw analogies between the auto industry and the smartphone industry. Yes, yes. And the Apple iPhone was an important gateway or real estate for that ecosystem. So in the internet of cars, what's more important, the connected car or the auto app store? I think uh, the most important thing is gonna be the platform. Now this has kind of been an epiphany for me uh, because I first thought, as a consumer guy, I thought, well, you know, if we just find the right set of applications and people just see the value in that, then we're on our way. Then I started talking to the people who are further ahead of us in the technology world or the streaming world, the content world. Even the most content-oriented people said to me, Jim, if we don't have the next uh, episode like Netflix does on our platform, we are not going to win. And I started realizing, holy cow, we have to design an embedded electrical architecture for a fully updatable vehicle to send more software to it than any of our competitors. And I will have no idea how the trip will be changed beyond first inning. Yeah. The dilemma we're, we're left with today is 
how much capability do I put in that embedded system up front for all those use cases I'm not sure about. You know, I'm sure Apple wondered, hey, do I need a uh, gyroscope in the phone or whatever the first generation sensor set was. We're going to that decision making now as an industry of solving edge cases every day that will really matter, you know, five years from now. But the, the autonomy that I'm most excited about for customers is when someone can go to sleep in their car, metaphorically, we've changed our industry forever. And you know what's exciting about going these digital zero emission products is they're going to last longer. These could be 737 airframes that we rebuild a couple times. Jim, autos are the ultimate global just-in-time supply chain. Tell me what Ford is doing to help re-architect this global supply chain and how much work is there to do? It's going to be a five-year all-hands-on-deck kind of transition for the company and for a country, frankly. I think, to me, semiconductors and batteries are really the next big thing. And, and the issue with batteries, when you get into the raw materials, is so much of precursor and processing, not just the mining, is done outside of the U.S. We have to localize the refinement and precursoring is just as much as the mining itself. You've been outspoken uh, lately about the need for the United States to direct our own energy future. What's your message to the Biden administration and the Department of Energy over that next five or five or 10 year period? Speed up. We need permitting from mines and we need permitting for the precursor and refinement activities to happen here in the US. Now, I've seen Canada do this. Canada has been very mm -hmm. proactive mm -hmm. um, because they have such a vibrant raw material ecosystem already. Our country has to speed up or else we will lose out. Um, the other thing is we have to start testing, building things, processing raw materials. We can't just observe or bring IP from overseas. We actually have to start doing it. Uh, and that's going to require some capital and some help. Without the government support, I don't want what happened in solar ecosystem happen in auto. What's Ford doing to improve the dealer experience? I've been spending a lot of time on products and also with dealers. And I knew enough to not simplify it that we need to just go direct. It's not that simple. I believe that we have to go to a non-negotiated price, totally online, transparent, 100% pick up a delivery model. But we also have to have the ability to do remote in most cases, in some cases like commercial customers, physical service of the vehicle. So what we're doing with the dealers, which is not easy, is we're stress testing each other's um, ideas around standards. Once we put in those standards, we can go to this leaner model for purchase and still have a physical follow-up where things you know, go wrong when they do, which they will, they're cars. You're a longtime volunteer and supporter of Pope Francis yes. Center, which provides food, shelter, and other services to people in need in Detroit. Out of all the causes that you could support, and I'm sure you support a range, why is this one so special to you? I started volunteering there when my grandfather was an hourly worker at Ford. And, um, sorry, getting emotional. And um, the homeless population here is like really far down their life drug addiction, abuse, um, mental illness, like you're decades into it. You have to have a place where they actually trust you to take risks, to move off the street. The next thing you do is you have to address the root causes, which is mental illness, addiction, abuse, all those things. So you need a lot of resources and they, they have to be there for a long time. So you have to commit to these people for months, if not years, to solve their problems living inside is literally the last metric in their life. I've watched homeless people, when you give them a place to live, to sleep on the balcony. Or you go inside and they got the TV turned up completely loud because they're used to the noise. And, and us who aren't used to that, like, oh, why don't you just give them a job? No, you have to solve the basic problem. So I believe, like many things in Detroit, that if we do it right, uh, we can really show a light for the rest of the country. It's a super important message. 
I, I've always felt the arc of Detroit and the success and then uh, the yes. challenges of Detroit yes. have mirrored our con country in many ways. Sure. If Henry Ford traveled through time to 2022, what would he think of this industry today and Ford's role in it? I think he would say the last 75 years were empty calories and I'm sure glad I landed right now. <laughs> Love it. Uh, I don't think he would have really loved the last 75 years of our industry. Mm -hmm. I think he was absolutely built, wired for this moment. I think he would have absolutely loved working mm. uh, at Ford right now. Um, I think he uh, would probably say, you guys are way too slow. Yeah, the clock speed uh, mm -hmm. over 110, 115 years ago was a little different. Yep. Well, here we go again, right? Yes. Now history repeats itself. Yes. Jim, you know, I, I really thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to sit down with me, talk about these important issues, not just for your company, not just this industry, but for the country. Thank you for the opportunity. I think it's really uh, wonderful that we had the chance to talk about such meaningful topics. Let's do it again sometime. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you.